Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I muted all. Good morning, good day, good afternoon to all of us. Good night to those on the East. Uh, we are opening our 17th uh, lesson out of 23. And we are now in the cluster speaking about how KMOs with their skills, with their capabilities can enhance a, a AI projects dealing with my, a machine learning mainly, but not only. So before I start, we are now in a series of three meetings that Art is leading us. And before I pass him the leadership, I want to share my screen and show you all our where our materials sit. And you all are, have, uh, are supposed to have uh, links. And if there are someone, if there are some links missing, I'll reshare them. So what are our, uh, what are our three channels of sharing? We have a Google Drive that was prepared and is maintained by Eli Mirun from Israel. And you can see here that we have all the, the list of all sessions. You can see that the next sessions are yet empty because we do not have, we did not yet uh, ha, uh, run these sessions. But if I go to session 16, you can find there the transcript of the recording. You can find there, no, uh, yes, the transcript of the recording, you can find there the safe chat. You can find there uh, a, a copy of the presentation and you can find there in the slides and you, oh, here we have the slides and you can find there my um, summary that was turned into, a, uh, into an article by Ellie. So in most meetings, we have all these materials, slides, transcript, chat, LinkedIn summary, whatever we need. That is one channel we all use, we all can use, we all can share. The second channel is our YouTube. Our YouTube is named KMGN, the KM Global Network. Uh, I suggest that we are all subscribers, but it's your decision if to subscribe or not. We have here already, as I already counted it, we have already 17, um, 17 uh, videos here. We have 16 videos of our different, uh, of various lessons. And we have here, as we said, we will, the search box, uh, in uh, the search box lecture of John Lewis, we also shared here to, so it will be useful, enabled, shared, used by each one and one of us. So I urge you to jump in and use it, whether if you're missing a lesson or if you want to come back or if you want to show it to someone else. Of course, in addition to these two, we have our WhatsApp where we have the ongoing um, uh, discussions. And once a week, I send an email with everything that was uh, with a summary and sending us to the LinkedIn and to the and to the task of next week, etc., and any new uh, important messages if they exist. So that's a reminder for those who don't have the links or don't remember they have the links but they didn't visit these channels yet. They can be all useful for you for all of us. Yes, Maria. Somebody is in the chat box asked for the link to the Google Drive because that's the one that has probably a long a long chain, a long URL. Could could you cut or Great. could somebody I cut and send paste it, that? I will send it today it on the email chat. with the materials. Okay. Also the came uh, also the YouTube drive uh, and also the Google Drive. I'll send it as part of my summary. I hope I don't forget. And it won't be there to remind me. Hey, did you send it? But I'll do it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, dear Art, uh, please start because I know we have only an hour from now or an hour a few minutes. So please start your a wonderful a discussion about challenges and risks. That's today, right? Yep. Coming. Yeah. No, no, that was last, last week. week. This week we're going, 
This week we're going to do data models and algorithms. Oh, knowledge engineering. Oh, that's next week. Knowledge engineering. Oh, uh, yeah. Last week. Knowledge yeah, engineering. So let's do it. Let's Today, knowledge let's engineering. Crank. People, very important, worth listening. Okay, so everybody can see. Uh, just to confirm that, right? I am sharing my screen. Yep. All right. Um, and I'm don't don't be scared. I'm not. Uh, you can't become a knowledge engineer in one hour or one day or one week. <laughs> um, what I hope to do is give you an appreciation of all of the different aspects and considerations that go into knowledge engineering. You know, an, a, an AI system also with augmented by and with the assistance of KM. Um, but aug doing the knowledge engineering of those business needs. Last week we talked about those business needs and where AI is having tr uh, trouble or as, as Maria, like, uh, like the way she expresses it, driving AI crazy. So where are the areas that are driving AI crazy where we can help? All right, I gave a, a pre-class assignment with didn't wanna have you read any articles. I think we're reading plenty of articles. Um, so I thought just a thought uh, exercise to um, make a list of, think about the knowledge intensive tasks that you perform in your work. And we were talking about this in, in the pre-session leading up while we're, everybody was, was signing on uh, in that you know, AI is coming after knowledge workers as well, but it can't replace you certainly, and the idea is to augment. So think about the work that you do, especially those tasks that are knowledge intensive and then see what's a possible candidate for being replaced by AI, either partially or completely. And then list some of the ways that you would help a team of AI developers in an AI system perform that part of the task. The reason I'm saying that is if AI is coming for certain areas of work and there's no stopping it, you might as well hop on board and help those AI developers along and then <laughs> move on to something else. One thing that's not going to ever change is the world is going to continue to grow more complex and the time frames are going to become more and more compressed. So uh, there's there's no shortage of opportunities for both uh, us as KMers and any knowledge worker. Okay. And thinking about, you know, we saw a lot of excellent vendor tools. So uh, I think we should always be keeping keeping in the back of our mind, okay, how can we use either that particular tool or tool like it? Uh, to help us along when when we get into, as KMers, our role in helping AI, okay? All right, so this particular module has two parts, two purposes. One, to get an appreciation again for it, the whole idea of there's data, models, and algorithms, and data is coming in, going out, being processed, right? And, but where does, does all of that come from? What, what very often isn't understood is you know, garbage in equals garbage out. We cameras can put a little more um, emphasis on quality of data, source of data, and, and those sorts of things. And then the secondly, how do you capture, identify, capture, and codify, and organize the knowledge needed to continually improve those systems? And that's human knowledge. And even if it's machine knowledge, there's a human behind it, and humans have to assimilate that knowledge, okay? And then, that's right, there's a third thing. Then how do we put all that into a KM system to curate and apply that knowledge, which we should be doing anyway. And you'll see, I, I often use the term human and machine knowledge, human and machine knowledge, because the AI is the machine knowledge, but still there's a whole body of human knowledge behind the curtain. And both of those deserve our consideration. Okay, so far so good? Okay, let's launch into it. Going back to our, our um, our knowledge graph. Today's session is data models and algorithms. We have five parts, knowledge engineering and AI system, uh, key entry points for KM, creating taxonomies and ontologies, knowledge mining and sense making, and then encoding that knowledge into an AI system. All right, so let's start with knowledge engineering and AI system, really the, the, the core essence of what we're going to be talking about. Last week, we had a, a four-step process, and this is very similar. So step one is model the baseline, then describe. So you start where you are, start with the baseline, describe the problem and challenge, then identify root causes and conditions for that problem or challenge or obstacle, and then 
model the solution. So we'll walk through the, those steps. Here's step, uh, oh, but before we do that, the key question is, what building blocks should we use, especially when we're doing the modeling aspect of data models and algorithms? And the answer, trying to keep it simple, and we should, because it can get pretty complex out there. There's an old notion that, it, that I kind of dusted off, and that's agents, activities, and artifacts. So if you wanted to have three key building blocks for modeling systems and processes and organizations, they're pretty much boiled down to agents, activities, and artifacts. So let's take a look at those. On the agent side, you have human agents. They're part of the mix. Now, more and more, we have automated agents. But there's a third type of agent that is often overlooked, and that is the organizational agent. Now, that's, that's that tend, you know, people don't often look at that, but uh, organizations agent could be a combination of humans and machines but that whole this is that committee and even on a, at a deeper level it's the culture of the organization it's the way all of the people and processes in that organization interact and they themselves if you're a complex systems thinker there are emergent properties that come out of this organizational agent and i said the simplest form is is committee and you know, very often accountability is lost through these organizational agents, um, and that and that can often cause problems. All of these agents, in one way or another, perform activities, everything that's going on, and those activities produce artifacts. All right, so that's where, and and this comes from Clyde Holsopel's old book on Handbook of Knowledge Management, still very valid. And um, the, the idea of agents, artifacts, and activities came from Bo Newman, who's a member of our, of our institute. All right, so let's go to step one, modeling the baseline. In terms of that, there are source agents activities and now algorithms, right, underneath that are producing the data, right? Here's where the data comes in, in the form of artifacts that serve as an input to a series of processes that are performed by agents and very often automated now to a greater extent in algorithmic form, even if they're simple business rules, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated AI program. It can be something as very simple as, as a business rule. You're Microsoft Outlook, you set up rules as to what you wanna have forwarded and what you wanna keep, right? Um, you're, you're out of office message, that's a simple algorithm. And then those processes produce artifacts which are used by agents, activities, and other algorithms, right? Hope this is making sense. And you can see this goes on and on through the whole value chain of the organization and its whole ecosystem. But again, to, if we want to model things, let's keep it in simple terms, inputs, processes, outputs, agents, activities, and, 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 and artifacts. But underneath now, we're getting into the algorithms that are assisting and performing these processes. Okay, so far so good? No, 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 please. Okay. Take this, I want to ask you to take this slide and give an example so people understand what's an input artifact of data. What happens? What Can you please describe the flow of, uh, of one example? Sure. So let's just, let's just say something simple as processing an invoice. Um, you know, uh, it could be a, a human receives a, a voucher or an invoice, right? That could, our organizations are set up in terms of forms. We do a lot of work in forms. So artifacts in our, in our organization can take on many forms. So let's just do a simple one, which is a, a standard form, which, which, which is an invoice. And that invoice then gets the, the, the first agent, right? The source agent, once may, may check that, one of the processes could be check that invoice for validity. Um, is it in, the, you know, is it in uh, euros when it should be in US dollars, that sort of stuff. Then once that pre-processing happens, and again, you can see it can be done by a human, by an automated agent, can be done by a team of people doing different, operating in different ways on that invoice, right? 
that once that's processed and approved, it gets sent over here for processing, which let's just say it's uh, evaluating to make sure that it's a valid invoice and making payment, processing payment of that invoice so the vendor gets it. The output artifact then could be a pr approval that where that invoice now says, okay, approval, a date, is it 30 days when they're going to pay that, that invoice? And then that gets sent on to a destination agent, which could be the accounting people who process the people in the treasury part of the organization that process the check to pay for that invoice that came in over here. Is that is that a, a, a get, does that convey the idea, Moria? I hope it, it, it's hey, simple Art. for people to understand. Yes. Hey, I will say, hey, all right, let me um, give one that's even simpler that most people would really understand, which is the paycheck. Hey. <laughs> okay. A person works oh, so yeah, their yeah. hours. Okay. Yeah. A person works so their hours and effort goes into um, a timesheet that they put in. That timesheet process goes into um, payroll. Okay. And then one of the activities of that is write a check or create a check. So the output, the artifact is to pay the individual. So you have the um, agents, which a lot of times you can look at as people, places, or things, because things can be the automation of a robot or a system. So you got a person here who is responsible for putting their time in. And then once they put their time in, which is the input, you have a payroll system, which is a process that is then responsible for the activity of paying the employee. So the output would be either an electronic um, check to the um, employee or a paper <coughs> check to the employee. Great. And, and let me add, great, great example, Annie, let me add to that now. So that's the simple part. What's important here is our organizations are becoming, as we said, more and more complex. Remember those five V's of information? Well, guess what? A a processing a check isn't just putting your, your, your pay on there. You've got to what? Withhold taxes, withhold retirement, calculate what those are, um, make, make sure that all the regulatory uh, requirements are met in terms of, of, of payroll. Um, so yeah, so there you, you can pile on and, and expand those, those processes. To do something simple very often has uh, a large volume of regulatory policies, procedures, and other things behind it. That's kind of why I visual, visualize it with, as this is. It, behind all of these simple processes, there can be a very complex, and that's where we need the automation, okay? All right, so does that, does that give, paint the idea? All right, so then here's the next step. Step two, model, use, the, use that baseline. Then that becomes our baseline. So we've articulated that we've, with a couple of examples. So the next thing is our glitch along the way. There are, play, you know, somebody uh, doesn't get their paycheck and they say, what happened to my pay? Or, or their paycheck is wrong, it's an error, right? Um, or, it or if we're talking about invoice process, and the reason I used invoices is, you know, paychecks, people better get paid on time, but invoices are another thing. They, they tend to get delayed and, and sent back for more work. Medical claims are the same way. You put in a claim for insurance to reimburse you for some medical treatment you had, and there's all kinds of delays, and, and you didn't check this box or that. So that's where we, we look at this base. I call this the baseline process. Now go in and say, where are the delays, the obstacles, the glitches, places where errors have been occurring? Identify those. That's step two. Then step three is, all right, remember last time we talked about the five whys? I've identified a problem, but maybe the problem might be occurring here, but the cause is back here in this pre-processing. That didn't happen correctly, right? Or... The, everything could be going well here. I think this is the problem, but no, the problem is actually the the culture or or, or a committee or, or something that that blocks it or alters it downstream. The point here is, once you model this, understand that if there's a problem, it can happen upstream. The, the cause of the problem, the root cause or condition for that problem, can be upstream in the process itself or downstream from it right? Then having done that, now we put together a solution. What does the world look like when that, when that uh, problem or challenge is removed? And again, that could be, a, that solution itself can be 
just a, a correcting the a human behavior, right? It could be modifying the algorithm or it could be changing the artifact. So let's talk about one thing that really causes a lot of these problems. And, and I have, oh, I, yeah, I have here, why is this so hard? Um, I didn't see that because I've got other stuff on my screen. Yeah, so why is this so hard? If you can imagine, all of these are different pieces of an organization and even different organizations. If you have out, if you outsource your payroll, you have, or you outsource vendor processing, you outsource accounts payable, guess what? You're now mixing pieces that have different syntactics different semantics often and different perspectives, okay? An accounting person thinks of things differently from the R&D person, from the marketing person, but in an organization, all you want all of those people working smoothly together. But if they're using different terminology, they even have different meanings as to what something a word means uh, or coming at it from a different perspective, that is a huge source for these disconnects, okay? And that's where we KMers can, can definitely play a role, which leads us to the key entry points for KM. Now, this next slide is going to really ring home, hopefully, uh, where the, the source of these disconnects are and how we can help <clears throat> how we can help clear those disconnects up. I call this the four hops, the root cause of many AI-related problems or any not problems related to knowledge work in general. You have a knowledge source, and some person over here is the recipient of that knowledge, okay? Usually there's a machine intermediation in between, whether it's simply, you know, sending a text message or something more sophisticated. I've got our knowledge source. We talked about Frank Calabrese being a knowledge source here. Um, and that, <clears throat> that human knowledge source uses different mental models, okay? Each person has a different set of mental models. This is an expert with 40, 50 years experience. This is a millennial just coming into the workforce perhaps, and or a Gen Zer coming into the workforce, totally different mental models, all right? So we wanna get that knowledge from this person to this person, and we may wanna get it into a machine. So hop number one is to draw that knowledge out. We can interview that person, do protocol analysis, all sorts of knowledge capture techniques of which there are many. And then we use drawings, flowcharts, notes, videos, have them tell a story, put it together as a case, lesson learned, things like that. But that we're making a hop now. We're going from mental models to a mediating representation that's gonna aid us in capturing that knowledge. That's hop number one. Hop number two now, if we want to make that knowledge available across our organization, that's where we get into what we, we KMers do, capture, codify, right? And But in the codification now, we put that, here's where we begin to put that knowledge into the form of algorithms, uh, logic diagrams, or knowledge graphs, as we saw from our uh, vendors, okay? That's yet another hop into a more structured form of content. So that, it's, a, it's now in the machine, available either to work automatically or to be transferred to another human. So when we get it out of the machine, once again, we have to have a dialogue in a form that this person understands. It may be different from the dialogue we use to draw the knowledge out of the expert. Now putting the knowledge back into the, the knowledge recipient can require a different set of, of expressions. So that's another hop. That's hop number three. And then going to that person, then that person is going to take that dialogue from the screen or whatever in their electronic interaction and put that in their mental model. That's hop number four. And there could be some disconnects. Do you under appreciate? There could be disconnects happening every step of the way of these four hops. So I'm um, this the purpose of this is just to point out all the different opportunities for going astray, for misunderstanding. We cameras have a role then in this knowledge transfer process and in this automation of knowledge process to minimize and be aware of these possible areas of disconnect. Okay, so far? Out. Yep. May we refer to, the, to these four hops, at least to part of them as uh, looking in the, uh, at the Seki model, saying that hop number one represents the externalization and hop number two represents the combination. Uh, 
Hop number three, maybe is only uh, sharing it out, going back to socialization, sharing it that back. And hop number four is the internalization of the individual. Exactly. That those are those are a, a great analogy, and, and the same the same idea, the same process is going on over these four hops. Yes, very good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now, all right, so here comes the, the, the real grunt work uh, that, that we need to be doing. And this also came up in our pre-conference con conversation, creating taxonomies and ontologies. And again, I'm not gonna make an ontologist out of you uh, if you're not already, uh, but I do wanna give you an appreciation of, of what's involved and maybe a few tips as to how, how to make it happen. Uh, and I'll go through this a little bit quickly because I'm, I'm thinking that uh, most of you in the audience uh, being K involved in KM probably, for instance, know about taxonomies, right? It's the is a relationship. Um, so you're building just, just like uh, a card catalog or, or just like the biological classification. Uh, table is a type of furniture, as is a chair, right? And there's what are the different types of tables, kitchen tables, TV tables, coffee tables, right? So there's a, there's a taxonomy. Most of us, if we look at our file system of our file folders, uh, it tends to be in the form of a taxonomy. In fact, SharePoint probably uh, promotes thinking about what these file folder names should be and putting them in the form of a taxonomy, right? And likewise, then you can model this in, in UML, right? Unified modeling language types of things. Uh, so take it from this form to this form to this form. And then ultimately, you can then, if you're building an AI system that's had, in which or knowledge has to be properly organized, then you can take that taxonomy and begin to write that in code, right? So you can go from a simple visualization or a simple way that you're actually applying a taxonomy now, model it perhaps in, the, in this form, like you in a UML-like form, and then ultimately it's going to get converted into an algorithm or in, into code. Okay, that's the taxonomy. There's a simple meronymy or a partonymy instead of something is a, it's or membership has a, right? So th this is a partonymy or a meronymy. Every car has an engine, a door, wheels, tires, et cetera, right? And our, uh, the, the, the knowledge graph we put together for this course, right? That's a, a meronymy. These are all the different parts of our AI course, right? And again, you can model that in, in the same way in various ways. But that still isn't, that's only two different types of relationships. A parent-child relationship either is something is a is a, a class, a subclass of something or a part of something. But as you know, and this is where ontology comes into play. There are many other relationships. Uh, you can be, you can have temporal proximity. You can have physical proximity. Uh, you can have you know, cultural aspects, you know, a whole bunch of things. So when you begin to fold in all of those other types of relationships, now you're in the world of ontology. And there are standards for doing that. RDF resource description framework is one of the most popular and that's in the form of what's called a semantic triple. A is related to B. A and B are concepts, which are typically represented as nodes. And R is the relationship or the association between two nodes. All right. So that's where we get a little bit more rich than just a plain old taxonomy. All right. Or a plain old meronymy. Ditto. There's web ontology language. You can take this graphic. This is what you'll typically work with with the user or with the expert you're trying to draw the knowledge out of and represent knowledge, but ultimately it's going to go into a, an algorithm or into machine code, and that's where standards such as RDF and OWL come into play. So I'm just pointing that out that you know, you're, you're going through this process of drawing knowledge out, have them tell a story. You as the knowledge engineer have to try and capture the key elements and a very simple way is find something and it's related to something else and begin to model that visually and then turn that over to somebody to implement in an algorithm or in code. All right, all right, let's keep going. Um, so what's the secret sauce here? All right, the secret sauce is 
data models and algorithms, graph theory, okay? When you have, as long as you, the reason for wanting to build and represent all of this knowledge in the ARB, semantic triple form, is that gets us out of the relational database. It gets us out of spreadsheets. Uh, as you know, those things, the more complex a process becomes, the harder it is to work with that process in a relational database. When we build these knowledge graphs, which remember we saw, we saw them in Megaputer's demonstration, and we saw them in Franz, right? Franz Allegro. Um, those are schema-less. So instead of building, starting with a model, which we do in the relational database world, we actually start with the query. What am I going to be looking? I want to be interested in how this is connected to this and how this is connected to that. So that then allows us to build a knowledge base in a knowledge graph form, which is based in mathematics and graph theory, okay? And then the lines between that, what now when you start doing this, what, what, you, you're, you're, you're including, you, you can put logic. In other words, I, that RDF triple, okay, let me just go back here. As I'm building these RDF triples, I can also begin to incorporate logic on top of that, right? So now I've, I'm actually blurring the lines. As you can see, the data models and algorithms are becoming blurred here, including inference becoming part of the data structure rather than separate. In the old AI days, data was kept over here and the algorithms were over here. But what I'm saying is they're beginning to be blurred and that's something we need to be aware of, okay? All right, let's keep going. Um, and orders of, and by the way, if you, if you look at the performance data, we're talking in a relational model doing an extensive, um, running a process that could take all night, literally, it can take minutes using um, graph theory and Google, where Amazon tr all is trying to tell you, hey, you bought this, you might be interested in this. They are using graph databases. Believe me, they are not using <laughs> relational databases. Okay, so how do we build ontologies? Okay, we're, we're, we, we've got parts of an organization thinking these languages, parts thinking in these terms, all right? So the ont having a, an ontology where we capture these expressions and their meanings and how they're related, right? That then gives us a unifying element to connect all of these different hops together, an effective way of communicating and allowing more efficient and effective knowledge flows, this underlying ontology. So that is a key part of Doing, of addressing those areas that keep driving AI crazy. Because what drives AI crazy is when somebody programs an algorithm where they're thinking that this term means one thing and somebody over here is using it and they're thinking that term means another thing. The ontology helps bring that all together, okay? All right, best of all, an ontology then makes it machine readable. If you put in a string of text, input it into a machine, it's just reading gobbledygook. It doesn't know. It doesn't have any idea of the meaning behind that text. So if you build an ontology then that collects the richness of the context surrounding a term and how it's related to other terms in what discipline, right? Then that allows it to the machine to make better determination and give you an idea of, of what you need to look at and what is not relevant to you. So this is how we get increased relevance in our AI systems, okay? Well, let's, hey, let's, right. uh, um, yep. Yeah, doesn't this also, I'm looking at your, your center of view, um, being able to actually map this out in ontologies and based on the activities, does this, does this also support the microservices architecture that's being built now um, for uh, the way organizations are operating? Sure, although, yeah, and there, there's some back and forth about that, whether we're going to do knowledge as a service or, or not and, and microservices. But yes, this is, this is an essential part of that because, again, you want to draw, you want to, if you're using microservices or a service oriented architecture, you've, or, you know, software as a service, again, making the proper match is critical, right? So this ontology will help you match up 
the right services to the right requirements. Okay, good, good, good thought, Annie. Yeah, I like I like having the dialogue here better, Keith. So keep it going. Um, so now, how do we build ontology? So this is where we KMers can come in. You want to then go in and 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 I don't know, have have you heard about card sorting? Okay. It's a pretty good process where you simply use index cards you, and, and you tell people, okay, you're doing, the, this is the work you're doing. And Annie, I know you remember Mike Stankowski used to say, what do you call all this stuff? And I think that had a lot to do with your, with your doctoral dissertation. What do you, well, how do you label and, and categorize intellectual assets, which are kind of these intangible things? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, what all the work that people do, they use language. So you want to capture the language they use and how it's organized in their mind. So one good way to, to, to get a, an insight into people's mental models is this card sorting technique. Just take a deck of blank index cards and begin to capture in words those concepts, right? So, you know, people are, whatever their process is, their, their activities, the agents they interact with, Put a card for each one of those, and then you can either sort them out on a conference table or put them on a sticky wall. And here's the key. This is a good exercise for drawing out knowledge, but then listen to them. And it's better to do it as a group, not just one person, but let's say a team. You're trying to say, okay, I am trying to help you, this team, do your work better. So lay out on the table or on the wall here all of the activities that you do and the people you interact with and prioritize, put them into different categories, but then listen to them. We, when we have done this exercise, believe it or not, we've gotten the best insights by encouraging these people to talk to each other out loud while they're doing this. And then you as the KM are sitting here off to the side. And if we hear something interesting, we say, oh, that's interesting. Why did you do that and not this, right? So a dialogue is important. To, to do it, but you're basically taking what's in somebody's mind and organizing it in a way then that can be augmented better by machines, okay? So the key role for us KMers is listening, be in listening mode, and then we're needed to ask questions. And the, res the end result is to build one of these ontologies, okay? Now that's the manual approach, okay? And you can get so far with that, but now when you have, you know, uh, thousands, sometimes millions of pages of documents, you need the automated tools like we saw demonstrated by our, by our vendors, okay? So you ingest those documents and data, emails, text messages, everything, you ingest all that and let the machine build the ontology for you, okay? Um, and then it outputs it in the form of a knowledge graph, which we saw in our demo. But that's a jump start recommended highly get the get a team of subject matter experts together and look over that knowledge graph and they will very well make some changes. I'm going to give you an example because I, Moria, you're probably saying, give me an example. I will give you, uh, I do have a use case coming up very soon uh, that'll kind of walk you, walk you through this process with a real example. But anyway, you, you can use text analytics, the tools we use like Megaputer and Franz Allegro um, to generate this knowledge graph, but then have the human experts review it, and then they can make modifications. You make the modification vis visually on the graph, moving those nodes around, and then the, the, the code is updated automatically. Okay? All right, and, and you can enter those updates. All right. So most AI platforms, by the way, come with an out-of-the-box ontology. But I'll show you in the example I'm going to give you where, you know, that out-of-box ontology, that's one of the four hops. <laughs> the, just as an expert can think differently from somebody else, well, the machine's ontology can be different from the way you think about things. Here's another thing. I, it, I mentioned this because this is important. It's gaining uh, traction, prominence, if you will. It's gaining importance. And that is layered ontology. We, when we build these things, and we've, we've built a lot of them, we, 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 somebody in our group called it a digital hairball, okay? You know how hairballs gather up or, or tumbleweed in the desert. Well, this is a digital hairball, and it can become very, very unwieldy. So what happens is this becomes very large. People have discovered, yeah, it's better to layer these things, all right? So important to know, layering your ontology 
is, is very important. There's an upper level ontology, which has general knowledge and way down here, as you get more specific, the more esoteric terms are down here in the lower layers. So very often an ontology will have an upper middle layer and then a domain specific layer. I call out Sumo because Sumo right now is, is emerging as one of the best upper ontologies. And this is where you have general terms and again, you want to make sure everybody's talking about the same thing, number one. And number two, the machine understands what you're talking about. So already, Sumo has 13,000 terms, 1,600 relations, and a whole bunch of axioms. They're a good example of putting logic into an ontology, okay? In hey, terms are, of axioms and rules. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we have a question on the okay. on board. Um, it might help an organization to conduct both methods to see and compare the results. So can you- Yes, um, and, I'm going, and, and I'm going to show you, yep, hold that thought, that's coming up, okay. but that, that is correct, a, a, that's good thinking, you need to do both. Okay, and also, okay. can you expand on the domain for a second, because I'm glad that's in there, oh, because okay. we have to understand next, uh, good. data and- Next, uh, mm -hmm. next slide, here's the domain, you know, so uh, uh, in, in music, okay? Uh, and I just, <laughs> right, um, the top ontology is just, uh, all the general language terms, you know, uh, like volume, or volume, volume means some means things to an audio engineer, to a musician, to a speaker, right? So we have the, the the top layer, you know, has has all those general language terms. Now you have musical terms, right? General terms interested in a musician, major and minor scales, and all that sort of gobbledygook, right? That goes in in the upper domain ontology. And then the specific ontology would be maybe jazz trumpet. They'd have a whole bunch of, of changes and, 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 and techniques and, and valve fingerings, okay? That would go down here in the more esoteric. Uh, a, more, a, a better example would be in, in the very complex world of, of drugs and, and risk just the risk management aspect of drugs, same sort of thing. You have, you have top layer, layer, layers, which are domain neutral, talking about things like processes, dosages even. You know, those are all words that are familiar to everybody, but then you get down to something more positive, the, the apopto apoptosis, right? Cell senescence, <laughs> all the, again, all the language that they use. And even lower, now you get into the specific, uh, you know, names like um, hydroxychloroquine or um, cytosol, uh, and, and that's in the lower ontology. So that, that's, a, so you see definitely the benefit. You don't want all of that in one digital hairball, okay? Where you can separate general terms to intermediate terms to super specific esoteric terms. You do that in layers within your ontology, okay? All right, I wanna, and so tip is don't reinvent the wheel. These ontologies exist. And that's why I pointed out Sumo in particular and these middle ontologies, you know, don't build this out from scratch, whatever you do. You can start with that card sorting exercise, but what we have done, then we go back to the main ontologies, these standard ontologies, and, and then see if we can't map them. Okay, and, and migrating legacy data, you do, uh, you can do that by, you know, mainly using this automation. You, you take the legacy relational database. If you said you're, you've had it with this because you have to do table joins and it takes so long to process a query and you have to build these stupid queries. You take that, output it to a flat file, use uh, t tools like Megaputer and, and Franz Allegro to build a graph database out of it. Then of course, you know, have do the expert uh, reconcile, reconcile, right? With, with experts and then um, now you've got your ontology from a relational database which is now in the form of a graph database. One area where you probably want to keep the relational stuff, if this is purely transactional, millions of the same thing going on every single day uh, in bulk, okay, that's a stable transactional process that goes here. But as soon as you want to get some intelligence out of all those transactions. What do people buy every other Thursday before a full moon? Can we adjust our marketing accordingly? That's where you get into this world. And those kind of queries can be made instantaneously. Those queries would take days almost uh, here on the relational side. Okay, knowledge mining and sense making. Let's get into the real application of, of, of how we apply this, um, AI and KM. All right. Um, Remember our flow down from last week. I don't want to lose sight of 
the organization, right? You know, the vision, the mission, everything has to be aligned. The strategic goals and objectives of the organization are still important. But now we've got a bunch of performance data. This is that lower part of that pyramid we, we talked, we showed you last week. Um, what's going on in team and stakeholder discourse? And we've got a whole body of reference documents. So we've got all of this now are our input data artifacts, okay? Ah, now here, this goes to the question that, that was asked, you know, humans and machines. There are two paths. There's the human path, which we, we K Amers can, can work. And then there's the AI path. AI path does that automated entity relationship extraction, build the knowledge graph like we saw, and you do perform machine analytics, text analytics on there. And you can use those analytics to pick out, you know, and sentiment analysis is important. People are monitoring, share, you know, um, rather Facebook and social media discourse and saying, okay, how are they talking about us? Are they talking about us in a favorable way, in, in an unfavorable way? What's most important? Salience means what's most important. What's the top of people's minds? What's not? Um, by, you know, all detecting bias, detecting misinformation, right? All of those things, as you know, are of, of, prime importance. So that's where analytics is coming into play. But again, to make sure that that ontology is correct, you need the, a, the human. You have an out-of-the-box ontology. It could be misinterpreting. It could be mistaking something as biased when it is not, or it could be letting something pass that is biased, right? That's where you need the human interaction, okay? And that's where we go over here. KM path, the, the humans do that same kind of analysis, right? And then look at the machine outputs, and this is what humans do better than, far better than machines. Does this make sense? Okay, so I take the, I combine the human insights with the machine analytics, and if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense, I go back and teach the machine, give the machine a lesson, right? <laughs> or the machine may tell me something. The machine may point it out some connections. Uh, uh, through, through these various parameters, and I'll say, oops, the expert missed it, okay? And so I want to refine that. Once I get those two in sync, now I perform interactions, which is that I make better decisions, more consistent decisions. And I take these outputs and put them into my processes, which we talked about earlier, you know, agents, activities, artifacts. Now we, we, we Im embed this new knowledge into our automated and semi-automated systems. So our processes are more effective, higher quality. And remember those, uh, those uh, performance parameters we mentioned, better decisions, faster decisions, fewer errors. That's where this becomes evident, okay? So there's the process. Oh, and then of course, constantly updating and refining our knowledge base back here, okay? Um, let me show you where the where this works. Uh, give a use case that we did. Um, it's in the area of of project intelligence. So project management was was an area where we developed a use case for this. And we actually did a proof of concept demo. Um, we're looking at humans, and we're, we pitted humans versus machines. The case example we used. You most of you should be familiar with the seven thirty seven Max Boeing aircraft that had two fatal crashes. And it was because of a, a lot of shortcuts that were taken. It was a software error, not making the where the automatic control system was was making wrong adjustments and causing the two planes to crash and kill hundreds of people. So we, uh, what Boeing did, you might might be aware, they after a certain amount of pressure, released the emails. You know, this is just like the, the emails from NIH about the, you know, about Dr. Fauci. So this is the same kind of thing. Emails were released and now that gives us a rich source of input, right? So let's, so we said, let's run the machines, the text analytics through these emails from the Boeing project team. And let's let humans also do the same thing. We didn't let the humans use the machines, okay? The machines, we let the machines run themselves with no humans and the humans run themselves with no machines and then did a comparison, okay? Here's what we, and here's the basic idea. And this, is, this is a good example of what we're talking about, how it can be applied. In the world of project management, 
especially large projects, they tend to be very complex. A lot of activity, right? Agents, activities, and artifacts carrying on here at the working level that all eventually gets, gets, uh, you know, uh, oops, sorry, gets filtered up to the very top executive level. And typically an executive says, I just want to see a traffic light. Are we on budget? Are we on schedule? Is this, are we still within scope? How are our resources? You know, so it gets very summarized and you can lose a lot of fidelity from what's going on, on the working, at the working level. And this tends to be rear view mirror oriented. It can take a lot of time for this information to work its way up to an executive. I can tell you some stories uh, I won't go into it now, but sometime I can tell you stories of where this was so slow. The executives at the top absolutely were clueless as to what was going on at the bottom. So how can we fix this, okay? P complex organizations, All right? So let's use our AI systems, okay, to do better project intelligence. Ingest all of that information, the, the, the project performance, all, all of the data, the discourse, build those knowledge graphs, build an operational knowledge base, but then have the humans on the side to be able to interact and, and check and validate, and then put those outputs just like, like we did in that, in that previous di diagram, reducing error and that, was that sort of stuff. Let me get to the, to the actual case itself. Project management, as you know, has all of these different phases. So now you can see how we're building complexity here from project initiation planning requirements design all the way to implementation to disposition all have their own agents activities uh, and, and artifacts right those activities tend to get siloed okay one good silo is very often project management is disconnected from systems engineering and it's, this has happened on numerous occasions that we've investigated. HR can be, can be kind of said, they're in their own little world. And when we're dealing with knowledge management, if we identify some of those gaps, it might be a person, a person, a key person didn't have the right skills. And so we need HR to do the training. Acquisition, contracts people, they're in their own little world. So, you know, we got to try and bring these together. And again, think of the four hops, Think of ontologies, think of semantics as a way to, to draw these different silos together. Also operating all this, you've got to deal with thousands of pages of specifications, guidelines in any project, especially a major large project. Um, there's the project management body of knowledge, an entire body of knowledge exists on, on how to do project management, right? Very useful tool. What is 700 pages long? Do you know all those 700 pages? Can AI help you extract the right thing you need to know from there and, and connect it to the standards that you're required to use, the guidelines and policies? Uh, that's what we're looking for. And then you've got all this historical data. And another problem is lessons learned. Uh, by the time lessons learned and, and new information is captured and works its way back into policies, it can be a very long lag time, okay? and this untapped tacit knowledge of the people who are working, usually at the working level at the ground, have this, okay? So, um, you know what happened with the with the doomed plane. So let's take a look through the emails. We, we took some of those standards and guidelines, we took the internal emails, and we took a, a couple of lessons learned documents from NASA's Ares rocket and constellation programs, okay? The, the, the one of the persons on our team was a NASA executive. And so he, he gave us this stuff. We ran the text analytics, all right? So notice what we're combining. It's the standards and specifications and guidelines that they were to use, the Boeing emails and lessons learned from a different organization other than Boeing, okay? Keep that in mind. You wanna expand your knowledge horizon. Run those analytics and in parallel have the, have the, the SMEs. Uh, take a look at that. So uh, yeah, we selected the documents, ran the analytics, and oh, and then um, performed a top level assessment of humans versus machines. Okay, so here's our three human experts. They're members of our institute, IIKI. And the two tools we use, you've seen Megaputer already, and we used a similar tool called Rasoka. Similar tools, slightly different approaches. So we used them both and compared them. Um, 
what we got out when we did that, when we crunched all of that information, including you know, the program management, body of knowledge and all this stuff, we had 33 categories, 1600 entities and over 500 different relationships. That was our digital hairball. We were able to capture sentiment in forms of salience, confidence levels. And you'll see what we focused on were weak signals. You know, you can get flags, sentiment levels uh, can give you flags, but you can also, you also want to look at semantic distance. Again, where are those connects where if somebody is four hops away um, talking about two totally different things as if they were the same thing, you want to be able to flag that. Okay, so here, and remember I mentioned you have an is a, you have a has a, there are, and this is again, just a few examples of, of the relationship types that were extracted from this body of knowledge and body of documents, okay? All kinds, and you know, you can add your own, to, uh, just showing you this as an example. There are many, many different types. This is the R in that semantic triple A, R, B. These are the R's, all the ways that things can be related and connected and associated. And somebody said, uh, I think, you know, if it was Annie or Mariah, people, places, and things. That's, this is what gets you to connect people, places, and things. All right, let's quick get to, to this. We crunched through the Boeing emails and found out what's being talked about the most. That's salience, okay? So you wanna see what are people talking about? And again, you can do this not just for projects. You can do this on social media to see what people are talking about favorably, unfavorably. And these are different things. There's polarity, you know, positive, negative. Uh, aspect means, uh, what certainty do people talk about a particular topic with? With what intensity? With what mood? And you see, you can flag. For instance, Boeing thought very highly of themselves. They come up all green and, and uh, way at the top of the list. Risk and the Federal Aviation Administration, the regulatory agency, they were kind of almost, we're, we're in somewhat negative viewpoint and even in some areas talking about it extremely in an extremely negative way. So this gives you some information, but this, these are the most talked about subjects. So any one of these can be a flag. Maybe somebody's being overly confident, maybe somebody's being overly pessimistic, but you, but, you, know, you treat these as flags and drill down. And we're gonna go into what we call weak signals. So let's go way down the salience and see if we can find some things. So I'll go through this quickly. We just, you could pick any one of these. So we said, oh, countless managers. That looks interesting. Let's, let's see what this is about, okay? So one hop away, when they're the, the closest connection, one hop away with count, when they were talking about countless managers was the uh, Singapore Aviation Agents. That's another regulatory agency, okay, in Singapore. And so let's see, let's drill in and see what, what were they talking about with, with this comment that gave, us a, that gave us a flag, a yellow flag and they're saying well the, there's a house of cards starting to topple and okay now by the way do you think the machine discovered this house of cards it pointed us to this but the machine did not flag house of cards it didn't know what it meant if you can imagine mr spock on star trek saying i can't imagine why someone would build a house out of playing cards the thing would be very unstable <laughs> right so humans are using these terms and and uh, same way, much of the brown stuff going to hit the fan, right? So let's go three hops out and see what we found, okay? And again, we found references to individuals, but this went beyond the Boeing. When we go three hops out, we now went into our NASA lessons learned, and the machine made connections from this statement about countless managers, which came up as a flag, to NASA's lessons learned and IPTs. And it said, okay, this is something that could be related to you. They're not using IPTs. You could use in, you know, integrated project product teams. Okay. Um, here's, here's an example though, of what's discovering what's missing. Risk remember was talked about and with a slightly negative aspect. So we can, and by the way, we can control, we can go three hops out, five hops out, seven hops out. If you go seven hops out, everything's connected to everything. So we like to hang around maybe three hops out. So three hops out from risk, we again, notice the, the NASA documents had some pretty good work. Boeing said risk was treated negatively, 
So it connected us to say, hey, maybe you want, the machine said, maybe you want to look at risk-informed design over here at NASA and maybe get some lessons learned about that. It's safer, all right? So here's the interesting thing then. Having done that, we said, okay, looking at the NASA body of lessons learned, they treated risk very favorably and, and they treated themselves highly and safety. So risk and safety and their own organization were way high on the list and in a very positive sense. The Boeing discourse, okay, they treated themselves very highly. They treated, as we saw, risk negatively. And here's where we found out a gap. Would you believe the Boeing aircraft company never once in all of those th thousands of pages of, no, I'm sorry, 100 pages of emails, never once mentioned the word safety. So here's how you can use machine analytics and AI and KM to say, hey, what's missing? Not only what's present, uh, an adverse uh, opinion about risk, but nothing talking about safety when a successful organization or NASA had, had accidents, but they learn from their lessons, they treat safety very high. So that point here is you can again slide this bar and this was only going two hops out, allowed us to discover this gap that, that was missing and possibly a reason, probably a good reason why those two planes crashed, okay? On the SME side, uh, uh, quickly, Again, we did not let the, the, the our subject matter experts have access to the text analytics. They had to do it on their own, but they picked out things like aggressive marketing. The machines did not. They were they said you were trying to prove foregone conclusions rather than seeking the truth. There was a potential flawed outcome, unwillingness to take action, passing the buck. All right. And the main thing was, or this is our expert's language, tail wagging the dog. What happened, there's two types of training. Level A is the more rigorous. Level B is the less rigorous. And through all of this aggressive marketing and political pressure, they decided to fall back to the lower level training when it should have been the higher level training. By going to that lower level training, they missed the problems with the software and we had two fatal crashes. The, the humans found that part, the machines did not, okay? The machines probably didn't even understand the difference between level B and level A training, okay? But our human experts did, okay? So that's the message, the message we've been saying all along. Humans have these qualities, they can teach the machines, and certainly we did. We go back and, and teach the machine. We taught the machines what the house of cards understood. And there was Jedi mind tricks was another term. We put that into the machine, what a Jedi mind trick is. Um, and the machines taught the humans a lot. They, they re, the machines revealed the exposure of risk and the lack, total lack of attention to safety that was not picked up by the humans, it was picked up by the machines, okay? So our conclusion is, hey, you got to use them both together because the machines and humans working together were more powerful than either one alone, right? And then to make that all happen properly, this is leading up into next week's uh, session, human and machine knowledge governance. And that's our, that, that'll be our topic next week, right? Um, encoding knowledge in AI systems. I'm just going to go through this real quick. Uh, hopefully that example gave you an idea of, of what really needs to happen here. But we in the KM world, we have all of these tools and processes, agents, activities, and artifacts, right, that we produce with our underlying ontology over here in the AI world, the AI team where we want to be supporting. They have their processes, and it's two ways. Their, their world is very customer-facing with chatbots and the like and DevOps supporting. They have their underlying ontology. How can we bring these together? Okay. And don't forget going back to module number two, all those, you know, how do we uh, use AI to leverage KM projects? We're helping them. They're coming back and helping us. We can, we can do a better job of our knowledge mapping, content managing, lessons learned and expertise location by applying these AI tools. So we ought to really be working with these guys and they need to be working with us. Okay. And we put that together into one system. We encode knowledge in AI systems. And one quick note, um, if you get into these AI development tools, you will sort of find areas that KM can plug into. 
for instance, lessons learned is a very easy one uh, to plug into. Um, so, because they'll they'll have little uh, areas to to capture uh, best practices and lessons learned, but the they they only tend to view them from a developer's point of view. We want to be able to help them from maybe the customer and understanding point of view. Okay, all right. So that's it. We went through a lot, and we'll get to your questions if you have any. Um, so this is what we want to do: input data, models, algorithms, capture, codify, and organize that knowledge, and then build a, that system, get those two together. And the key there is humans and machines working together, teaching each other, being more powerful than either one alone. Next week, we're gonna do, how do we sustain that? Um, governance is important, all right? And your questions, which you will receive uh, for, for your pre-work is, is along the lines of things like, how do we keep AI from going rogue? Because AI can go rogue. If you don't have adult supervision, you know, people are talking about and getting excited about machine learning. Machines learn on their own. Uh, you got to have that human supervision, right? And then again, let's get to metrics and performance measures. And then how do we work with AR and all the teams together in, in order to perform this, this sound governance? But uh, for instance, if there is a skill shortage, if one of those problems and shortfalls is because of lack of skill or wrong skills or wrong uh, career development, we can fold in HR, project management, all those other things, we'll, we'll bring them together. So that's what we're gonna wrap up with um, next week. Here's your future learning. Um, so you, you'll have these when, with the handout, uh, which we'll, we'll make available. And as always, I hope this, I threw a lot at you, um, but my main goal here is to give you an appreciation of the real depth that we can get into and the real improvements we can make if we indeed make this KMAI partnership happen successfully. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to you for your questions and, and comments. Wow. <laughs> we love it the way you structure things and they are defined as a process step after step. Everything is very, very clear. Well, good. I know I had a lot that was throwing a lot at you, uh, but like I said, this this is the nature of the beast, and, and it's a challenge. So I think we should rise to this challenge, <laughs> personally. I would argue that the role of the KM is not only the ontology, but also the knowledge engineering itself, being a business analyst, as he always was a mediator between business and technology. Definitely. And that's, you know, I, that's, we're trying to bring that home last, last time as well, the, the, the alignment, right? Identifying business problems and then matching those to AI KM solutions. Yeah, so you're correct. It's, it is all the above. And that's another thing. Not too many people <laughs> are looking at the big picture, the full spectrum from strategy to, to goals and objectives, right? To uh, performance drivers. People tend to look at those separately. Like some people look at only on performance, organizational performance, blah, blah, blah. Others are doing strategy. Yeah, we're up here at the, at, in, in the ivory tower doing strategy. Then you got people down working in the weeds and the coding. Um, yes, yeah, so Mar Maria, you're right. KM, again, we can fill that. Uh, not too many people do that. I think it's a great opportunity for KM. We can be the bridge to stitch together all of those different aspects. And they need to be stitched together because where a rogue AI and problems like airplanes crashing out of the ground, crashing in the ground happen and all the other problems we're faced with um, happen because of these disconnects. Um, these pieces of the organization are not talking to each other in the way that they should. We cameras, I think, can, can step up and help help facilitate that flow. Yeah, you know, I think a, a big place too is um, context and curation. I think that the knowledge manager is more aware of that and they could actually lean and help more toward quality. Um, and one of the reasons I, I say that is I'll give an example of like even expert locators. There was a prominent system where um, what they did was they read the emails in order to determine who the experts were. And it did not uh, really, it was not successful because the context was most experts do not say a lot in emails. 
most novices who are looking for knowledge do. So that kind of went backwards where novices were actually designated as experts and experts were designated as novices. So in that point, you could always look at context and also curation at the end to verify that you know it, it is of quality and of, of integrity. So I think KMers play a really big role in context and curation. I uh, think- 100%, 100% agree, yes. I think this ends our time because we have so many ideas and comments, but I think we have to let people go mm -hmm. and just say thank you to all. Annie, yes. great addition, great insights. Art. Thank you for the yeah. dialogue. It was it was good having a dialogue mixed in with the presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so bye all because I don't want to take too much of your time. And we'll see you next week with the third part of our triology uh, conducted by Dr. Art. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>